Hey everyone, welcome back for more human physiology. So this chapter is going to focus on the central nervous system. So subsequent chapters on the nervous system are going to start focusing in on particular parts of the nervous system. So what we covered in chapter 12 was basically just giving us all the fundamentals we need to understand how signals are sent in the nervous system proper. So we talked about neurons and types of neurons. We talked about uh, membrane potential, we talked about neurotransmitters, we talked about graded and action potentials. So now that we have that kind of foundation to stand on, we can talk about specific structures in the nervous system and how they use the concepts that we talked about in chapter 12 to accomplish what they are me meant to accomplish. So this particular chapter if you go through the anatomy and physiology textbook is actually quite a long one, but fear not because most of the information in this chapter of the book is focused on the anatomy of the central nervous system. And I've said it plenty of times already, this is not an anatomy class. This is a physiology class. So there's going to be plenty of stuff in that chapter of the book that we are just going to outright skip. So to help you out here, I'm telling you to go ahead and skip all of section 13.1, and then most of 13.3 we are going to skip as well, and we'll make it pretty clear which things to focus on uh, in these lecture slides. So a lot of what we're going to focus on is just the major relevant structures of the central nervous system, so that's brain and spinal cord, and then we're going to have a lot of focus on after we talk about those structures, we're gonna focus a lot on spinal nerves and cranial nerves and how they function to bring afferent information into the central nervous system and how they send efferent information back out. So this is hopefully not going to be too terribly long of a lecture series on chapter 13. So we already know by now that the central nervous system consists of your brain and your spinal cord. So that's your control centers in your homeostasis loops and reflexes. And then PNS is going to be your afferent and efferent signals. That's going to be the spinal nerves and cranial nerves that we will talk about later. So our first focus should be obviously the brain. So the way we're going to kind of do this is we are going to start with the brain, the outermost portion of the brain, which is the cerebrum. And then we're going to start working our way down through the midbrain into the hindbrain and brainstem. And then we'll work our way down the spinal cord. So we're basically going to take a top to bottom approach here. So the cerebrum is the largest portion of the brain. And we've already seen the cerebrum before when we talked about the distinction between gray matter and white matter in the central nervous system. So the outermost layer of the cerebral cortex, or excuse me, the outermost layer of the cerebrum is called the cerebral cortex. Do you happen to remember whether that was white matter or gray matter? Hmm, yeah, that was gray matter. And then uh, deeper than the cerebral cortex, there's going to be uh, tracks of neuron axons that lead down through the brain into a bunch of different structures in the brain itself and then down through the brain stem and down through the spinal cord. So those tracks of axons, were those white matter or were those gray matter? So you may remember those were white matter. And then we also have structures within the brain itself where we find uh, cell bodies of neurons clustered together and of course those are called the basal nuclei and those are gray matter as well. And you can't really see it in this particular picture, and we'll have a, a picture later on that shows it a little bit better. But the cerebrum consists of two different hemispheres. So you have a right hemisphere and you have a left, left hemisphere. So these cell bodies in each hemisphere are kind of separated from each other, so it would be nice to have a way for those cell bodies to communicate with each other. And that is what the corpus callosum does. So that is basically a big tract of axons that allows communication between the left and right hemispheres of the cerebrum. It's kind of like a bridge that allows communication back and forth between the two hemispheres. So in addition to splitting up the cerebrum into hemispheres, we also split it up into four lobes. So it's a total of eight lobes if you consider four lobes in each hemisphere. So uh, these hemispheres, excuse me, these lobes are the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. They are not actually colored like this. These are artificially colored so that you can see the distinction. Just wanted to make sure that that's clear. I think that probably is clear to most of you. So 
you'll want to recall that the cell bodies of the cerebral cortex, so that outer layer of gray matter, are going to receive afferent information that is directed up through the spinal cord, up through the brainstem, into the thalamus, and then the thalamus directs that afferent information to the appropriate processing center in the cerebral cortex. So we know by now from what we said in chapter 12 that the cerebral cortex cell bodies receive afferent information and then as part of the integration and response they send efferent signals back out the way the afferent information came. So back down through the brain, through the spinal cord and to whatever the effector is meant to be. So the splitting up of lobes, all these lobes consist of cortical areas, meaning they have cerebral cortex. Where the thalamus chooses to direct that afferent information is going to depend on what the nature is of the sensory information. So each of the lobes contain these areas that are associated with different types of sensory or motor faculties. For example, we saw an example in chapter 12 of how afferent information coming from your eyes, the things that you see, right, that comes from the optic nerve into the thalamus, and then the thalamus directs that back here to the occipital lobe. So the thalamus is directing that to the cerebral cortex of the occipital lobe because these are cell bodies that are specialized for processing visual information. The temporal lobe would be specialized for things like hearing. So your ears, when you hear something, you send, a, send messages via action potentials through the vestibular cochlear nerve into the thalamus, and then the thalamus will direct that afferent information to this lobe right here. So, want to make sure that that is clear. So, each lobe is going to do more than kind of what we're summarizing here very quickly, but this is the basic idea. Uh, the frontal lobe will contain the cell bodies of mostly motor neurons, so the frontal lobe isn't necessarily going to be involved in processing afferent information as much. It's going to be more for efferent stuff, so sending motor information, sending orders to muscles and glands rather so much than receiving afferent information. The parietal lobe back here is going to be for a lot of our somatosensation, meaning the things that we feel in terms of touch and vibration and temperature. So if you burn yourself or if you prick yourself, that afferent information is going to be redirected by the thalamus probably to the parietal lobe. And we'll see an example of that later. It's probably going to be this region right here just behind the frontal lobe. Uh, the temporal lobe, like I said, will be a big center for hearing and also for memory, and we might talk a little bit about memory later. And then, as I said, the occipital lobe is mainly going to be for visual processing. And like I said, these lobes do more than what is indicated here, but this is just kind of the general idea for what their major responsibilities are going to be. Okay, so this is a figure that if you just looked at it without any sort of instruction, you probably wouldn't know what the hell's going on, and I totally would not blame you. So let me try to set this up, because if I can kind of get you oriented to what's going on with this figure, you're going to, I think, get a lot out of this, and you'll kind of understand a lot more about how afferent and efferent information are treated by the cortex. So... In this top-down view of the brain that you're looking at here, you have this little purple sliver of the brain that goes from left to right hemisphere, and then you have a yellow sliver right behind it. So these are two particular parts of the cerebral cortex. The one in purple is called the somatosensory cortex, and it is located in the most anterior region of the parietal lobe, so it's right behind the frontal lobe. And then in yellow, you have the motor cortex, which is in the frontal lobe, and it is the most posterior part of the frontal lobe. So it's right in front of the parietal lobe. So these are going to contain the cell bodies of neurons that are most heavily involved in the afferent information behind uh, the things that you feel in terms of touch stimuli, like being poked or prodded or feeling vibrations or burning your hand or freezing your hand or things of that nature. And then the motor cortex is going to correspond to the motor neurons that are going to send efferent information out to the appropriate skeletal muscles so that we can 
take the appropriate afferent response and come up with the appropriate efferent response. So let me give you an example here because this is still kind of an abstract issue and you may still not know exactly what the heck I'm talking about. Okay, so one thing that is very interesting is that if you look at these kind of close-ups here, this is what's called a somatosensory homunculus diagram. It's kind of, I'm not going to lie, it's kind of nightmare fuel, right? So you're seeing all these different body parts kind of growing out of the cortex here. It's kind of weird, right? It looks weird. Well, what this is meant to indicate is that different cell bodies in different part of this cortex are going to be responsible for information coming from different parts of the body. So imagine that you're eating your lunch, you're eating, say, uh, a hot, hot slice of pizza, and let's say when you uh, take a bite of that pizza, it's scalding hot, and let's say that you burn your lips and you burn your tongue. Well, since this purple cortex here, the uh, somatosensory cortex, since that is pulling in afferent information, what that's telling you is that since you burned your mouth, that afferent information that comes from the sensory neurons in your mouth and in your tongue, that afferent information is going to be directed to these particular cell bodies right here, the ones that correspond to the mouth and the tongue. It's not going, that afferent information will not go to other parts of the cortex in which the cell bodies are receiving information from somewhere else in the body, like the feet or the toes. So, on the other hand, if you Stay, say, step on a Lego, which I think if you're a parent, you know how much that hurts, right? If you step on a Lego, that afferent information coming from your foot will be directed to a different part of the somatosensory cortex. So the idea here is that cell bodies that line the different parts of the somatosensory cortex are responsible for receiving afferent information from different parts of the body. And then if you look at the motor cortex, it's the exact same sort of thing, except this is for outgoing efferent information. So if you, say, step on a Lego, and the appropriate efferent response is that you pull your foot up and you kind of hop on one foot and you're hopping mad. I think that's where the term came from, hopping mad. Someone must have stepped on a Lego when they came up with that. Uh, so the idea here is that if you want to send an efferent signal to a particular part of the body, that efferent signal is going to start in a particular set of cell bodies in the motor cortex. So if we want to move our legs, we would want the efferent signal to come from these cell bodies right here. Whereas if you want to talk or move your mouth, you would rather use these cell bodies over here that correspond to making facial expressions, vocalizing, or doing anything else that would involve your mouth. So ultimately what it means, and it's kind of nice that we can see here that the motor cortex and the somatosensory cortex are located so close to each other. What this means is that if you step on a Lego, that afferent information will go to come, excuse me, come from your foot. So it will go to these cell bodies right here. And then we can get integration and then we can set it up so that the efferent signal comes from these cell bodies right here so that those efferent signals can go down to the legs so that we can hop on one foot to alleviate the pain and we don't want that efferent signal to go to the mouth. Imagine if you step on a Lego and the automatic reflex is that you start moving your mouth. That doesn't really make any sense, right? So hopefully you have now a better kind of idea of what different parts of the cortex are going to be responsible for doing. You have this somatosensory cortex that pulls in afferent information regarding touch, temperature changes, and things of that nature. Not so much vision or hearing or anything else. As we said, other parts of the lobes are going to be responsible for things like that. But hopefully you have a little bit of a better grasp on this now. Okay, so let's talk about the, uh, the hemispheres just a little bit more. So in this picture, as promised, you can actually see this corpus callosum a lot better. We've got these big tracks of axons that connect the different parts of the right hemisphere with the different parts of the left hemisphere so that we can get kind of communication back and forth. So one concept that we are going to see quite a lot, and this is relevant since we do have two hemispheres of the brain, 
we need to be aware of sometimes afferent and efferent information will start on one side of the body and end up going to the opposite side of the brain. So if you say, step on a Lego with your right foot, that information more than likely is going to be processed in your left hemisphere. This is what's called crossing over to the contralateral or opposite side of the body. And this crossing over of signals is going to happen a lot more often than it will not. It doesn't always happen, but I would estimate it's probably somewhere between 80 and 90% of the time. Something that happens on the right side of your body will be processed in the left and vice versa. So in the case, we already saw an example of this in looking at vision in chapter 12. So a lot of times with some visual processes, if you're looking at the nasal retina of your left eye, that visual information coming from your left eye will cross over to the contralateral side and be processed in the right hemisphere of that particular visual cortex in the occipital lobe. That does not apply to the temporal retina, in which case that information stays on the same side, or what's called the ipsilateral side. So vision is kind of a weird example because some parts of it cross over and some parts of it do not, but I will be sure and show you a specific example later that shows you how afferent and efferent information can cross over like this. Okay, so that's going to do it for this particular video. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too overwhelming so far. So we're pretty much done with the cortex at this point. So we are going to move down deeper into the cerebrum next time. And we will start talking about the basal nuclei and what they are all about and what they do. So thank you for your attention and I will see you next time.